Hello and welcome to Cycling Weekly's preview of the 2018 Giro d'Italia, which is the 101st edition of the Italian Grand Tour. And I'm joined here today by Henry Robertshaw, who's one of Cycling Weekly's news writers. And we're gonna go through the route, look at the key stages, and also uh, look at the key contenders in this year's race as well. So starting with the route, Henry, what are we looking at? Well, a very brief over overview, 21 stages, eight summit finishes, more than 44 kilometers of time trialing, which I think is the most of any Grand Tour this year. Um, a typical Giro route with lots of tough climbs, including the Monte Zoncolan, returning for the first time in a few years. Um, we'll come on to that later. If you want to see the route in more detail, then we have a separate video where we go through each individual stage. But in this video, we're just going to concentrate on the key stages. So, what's uh, what's the first sort of key stages we need to be looking at? Well, first three stages are in Israel. Um, we've got 9.7k time trial and then two sprint stages. But I think the first real key stage for the GC contenders will be stage six, which um, just as it was last year, big summit finish up Mount Etna. Um, they're approaching it from a slightly different angle than they did last year, um, but it's a pretty similar climb and it's such a long climb. Yeah, it looks like 30 kilometres long. Or yeah, I mean, like you look at the Giro route maps and it says 15 kilometres, but that somehow they've managed to miss out the first 15k of the climb. Um, it's a pretty steady ascent, I think about 6% average gradient, uh, nice wide roads, and fingers crossed, last year's up. Etna wasn't the most exciting summit finish in the world, but yeah. we're hoping for a bit more fireworks this time. Well, it was it was exciting from the perspective of Jan Palanche, yeah. who won with an epic solo breakaway and was able to hold off the bunch. But from a GC perspective, it was pretty, pretty dull. <laughs> yeah, there's a big, big headwind up there. I mean, it's obviously a very exposed in Sicily. Um, big, um, wide, volcanic, open landscape, so the wind really got up and hit a big headwind, which discouraged attacks until the last Yeah, everyone of sat in. <laughs> yeah, last few hundred metres. So fingers crossed we'll have um, a bit more attacking racing this time um, to really start to set up the GC battle. So after the Mount Etna summit finish, um, where do you envisage the next sort of key stage to be? Well, as usual in Grand Tours, the Giro d'Italia organisers, they try and put the real big mountain stages at the, at the weekend so people can get out on the road so I see big crowds, everyone can watch on TV. Um, so stages eight and nine are the next big ones to look out for. Back-to-back um, -back summit finishes. It's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. It always is, especially stage nine to Gran Sasso d'Italia, uh, which features another long uphill gradients um, and double-digit gradients at the end as well. So it's going to be real sting in the tail of that stage. And the organisers seem to have done the same thing as Etna on the route profile. They only seem to think that the second half of that climb yeah. is a climb. <laughs> yeah, so you've got so the organisers sort of they pick out climbs that they give you little uh, little profiles of to give more detail. Um, but what they've done here is they've taken the last thirty k and split it in two, so you get two little profiles, each of which is like six seven k long. Um, but really, the last thirty five k of this stage again is uphill a few little descents here and there but mm. the the last bit of the last climb is really really tough i think the best way to sort of describe it is like with regards to when the tour does the telegraph and the glibier it's sort of do, doing not, two, sure, not sure we're quite in that territory no but yet, it's sort but. of it's doing two climbs but sometimes the tour organizers say oh it's the telegraph then the glibier but you don't really get much of a rest it's kind of yeah one, yeah exactly it's straight into the other so well actually the, the, looking at the route profiles here i don't think there's any descent at all after the first climb it's just sort of like flattens out a bit and then ramps yeah. up again so yeah good luck to them so after stage eight and nine um the one that catches my eye in particular is stage 14 which is the zonkalan summit finish well, I think this is um, the stage that when the route came out, this is what we were all looking forward to. Um, Monster Sunkland actually hasn't been in the race since 2014, so it's actually a few years since we've been there. But this is an absolute brute of a climb. I mean, yeah. um, we talk about people attacking. People don't attack on the Zonkaland. But these are, <laughs> this has got long, long sections at 20%. There's a sign over the road at the start that says, Welcome to hell. <laughs> You, you don't attack on this. You just you just try and ride as well as you can. Yeah, you just try and get up. Yeah, exactly. Like if you're if you're an amateur, if you can get up this about walking, then yeah, you can pretty much get up anything. Yeah, I mean it's the other thing is like the overall gradient is about twelve yeah. uh, percent over sort of a 11, 10 kilometer climb, but it's 
not representative. It's not a, a, a good statistic because the final five kilometres is 14.9% average. The great thing about Zonkalan is that if you ever get to go there, the fan, the way the road uh, works, it goes up through a forest and then goes through a tunnel. And then when the riders come out of these tunnels, there's this huge nat um, natural amphitheatre with like fans everywhere. And the riders are just like suffering through this huge gradient. Yeah. Um, and it's just absolutely brutal. Um, it's great to watch on TV. I mean, you might get a bit nervous with fans running alongside the riders and stuff, but it's just, it's just amazing to watch. And if you're going to watch one stage of Zero, it's got to be this one. I'm really looking forward to the Zonkel on stage. I can't wait. I mean, that is the one I'm looking forward to the most. I just hope it delivers. Yeah. So you mentioned then after that, that the day after is a tough day, but then where, where are we looking? So you've got a rest day and then stage 16 is the biggest time trial of the race. 34.5k and the Zonklon at one end of the scale and this is really flat, big open roads. Um, it's it's going to be a real test. Anyone who's, if they can succeed in the Zonklon, succeed in this, they're going to win the Giro d'Italia, yeah. to be honest. And it's almost as if the organisers have thought, right, we'll put in that killer Zonklon finish with, with the idea being that pure climbers might get a, a time gap there and then the time trialers who can climb can maybe claw something back the next two days later to keep the race alive. Yeah, and what's interesting is quite often in the Giro, you look at time trials and you say, oh, it looks flat, and then you watch it on TV and it's really twisty, night, tiny, narrow rows. This isn't, this is, apart from the end, I think you said there's a bit more technical, but it's on big, wide rows. Yeah, it gets a bit, a little bit more technical as they get into um, the urban area where it finishes, but it is, a, it is a tester's course. It's like an English, like a British time trial. Yeah. <laughs> but... Um, I think it's it's because it is very flat, pan flat, and not technical. It's going to be very fast, you know, over 50k an hour for the winner quite easily. And so aerodynamics in that case have got to be key. Absolutely, yeah. So I think you know the faster you go, aerodynamics becomes more important. So after the the time trial, we're then heading into the business end of this year's Grand Tour. So what what we're we looking at? What are the key bits? Stage 18, 19 and 20, three more summit finishes. Um, stage 18 is to Prata Novoso, which is a ski resort. So nice, big, wide roads, um, relatively six, six. They're basically, they're roads meant for coaches going up to ski resorts. There's no, there's no big gradients there. Uh, but stage 19 is an absolute beast. Uh, Col de la Finestra, which if you've never seen on TV before, it's absolutely spectacular because it's, it's gravel. The last 10K and gravel roads. So um, you have uh, dust flying up from the teen cars and everything. Um, and it's just, it's, it's just amazing to watch again. But it only comes midway through the stage. So then you've got to climb to Sestriere where they finished a few years ago. And then up to the Jaffarel, which is another absolute beast of a climb. And this is such a hard day. That is, that's the biggest day out really, isn't it? That is, if there's going to be a queen, if you're going to call a stage a queen stage mm. of this year's race, that's it. And I mean, Finestra is also the, um, which translates to window, by the way. Window to what? The, the, I don't know. The, the, the <laughs> climb of window. Yep. Um, that is this Chima Copy in this year's race as well. We should point that out. Yeah. But, uh, so that's the highest point in the race. And there's a nice little, uh, nice little prize money for whoever gets over the top first mm. as well. And double points in the mountains classification, which will be interesting by this point. So straight after that sort of queen stage, um, with the Chima Copy and the Finestra, we move on to a monster that's 214 kilometres yeah, as, long. as if 180k with four big climbs was enough. We've got 214 with oh, only three big climbs. Um, the first half of this stage is pan flat, so go, go out for a ride, do something, go and do your shopping, because you don't want to watch the first half of this stage. Um, but then you've got three really hard climbs, um, including the final climb to Savinia. Um, where because the last stage this year is not a time trial, it's a sprint finish around Rome, um, this is where the Giro will be decided. So after stage 20, we move on to stage 21, which in this year's edition is not a time trial, unlike last year, yep. where we saw Tom de Mulan overhaul Nairo Quintana. Um, this year's the sort of processional stage, a flat sprinter stage in Rome. Yeah, well, we say it's a sprinter stage. I mean, by this point, it's so brutal, this race. If there's any sprinters left, last man standing, really. I mean, normally it's Nitzolo is the only sprinter left in the race yeah. by this point. Yeah. Put your money on him. Uh, everyone, Do it now, all, you get pretty good odds. Yeah, all the other sprinters will have gone home. <laughs> Talking about riders, yeah. we're going to do that now. Um, what, which are the riders that you think we should be keeping an eye out for? Um, 
well, there's probably like four big GC contenders who we're going to look at. Uh, right. So we've got Chris Froome, uh, Tom Dumoulin, Fabio Aru, and Simon Yates. Uh, they're sort of the riders in this race with um, with Grand Tour results behind them. I mean, you've got riders like Miguel Angel Lopez, who's a real up-and-coming Colombian from Astana, um, who could have good results in, um, in the future. But Chris Froome, Aru, and Dumoulin are the three Grand Tour winners. Chavez is, has been... Uh... Chavez has been up there, but he had an absolute nightmare of a 2017 season. Mm. I mean, he finished uh, podium positions in the Giro and the Vuelta in 2016. And then I think it was 11th in the Vuelta this year, in 2017. Um, he had an injury hit at the start of the season uh, last year. And we haven't seen too much of him this year either. So it's a bit of an unknown qual- quantity. So I think Simon Yates is going to be the, the man for Mitchelton Scott in the Giro. Right. So we've got there the, the sort of Premier League yeah. GC contenders. But it seems that there's quite a lot of other GC contenders knocking on the door who are in this race, which I find quite exciting because often you get like a star performance, you know, you think back to Nairo Quintana just bursting onto the scene, you often, mm. this is a good, I think this is a good potential here to see someone who's not on everyone's radar. Yeah, I mean, through. we saw Stephen Kreuzweig a couple of years ago, for yeah. example, until he crashed uh, into the snow on the descent. Gutted. Absolutely, I'm still gutted about that. Yeah, gutted. Yeah, there, there are quite often a few up and coming riders. Um, I mean, I'm going to look at uh, Team Sky because Froome, to be honest, hasn't been in great form this year. Mm. Uh, he's just outside top 10 Ruth Del Sol, off form in Torino. But looking at the other people in his team, one name that really stands out to me is David De La Cruz, who signed for Team Sky this year and has just really gone from strength to strength. He's got some great results, uh, really high potential rider. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see how he does this year whether or not he might, he's probably going to be called in to support Froome, to be honest. But if he's given a chance to go for himself, if something happens to Froome early on, he crashes or whatever, then David De La Cruz is a great uh, great name who I expect would do pretty well in this race. Well, you say David De La Cruz, but Team Sky is really a, an absolute super team in yeah. this race. I think there's five riders straight away in Team Sky squad for the Giro that I would put down as, if they were riding... As, uh, on another team they'd be the leader of that team yeah, I mean, they'd be you know they'd all be riders who were going for top 10 on GC like you know you've got names like well Wout Pools oh, yeah. uh, Kenny Ellisond and uh, in addition to uh, David De La Cruz also Sergio Hanau yeah I mean they're all, all really good riders um, Ellisond has sort of flattered to deceive a bit over the last few years I mean since you moved to Sky he's, um, since uh, he got that big welter win a few years ago for FDJ and then since he's been in the sky it's been a bit um, bit under the radar but I think it'll be really interesting to see how he gets on in this mm-hmm. race um, looking elsewhere I think we've got Rowan Dennis there's mm-hmm. another rider who's flat to deceive he w- said last year it's like Giro big goal big goal I'm going to go for the Giro for the GC end up crashing early on and abandoning yeah it's a rider who's He's got the potential. It's yeah. really frustrating. He's got the potential. He's won every single time trial he's taken part in this year. Um, and with that, those two big time trials this year, then it's a race that he could, if he gets a bit of luck and is in a bit of form, he could do pretty well in. Yeah, I spoke to Rowan Dennis at the, at the BMC camp in uh, December, and he did express that he wants to have a go at the GC in the Giro. Um, and he cited that, you know, originally Bradley Wiggins was sort of his inspiration as a time trial uh, rider who could then climb, but more recently he's taken inspiration from Demula. He's, you know, looking like he's in good form. If he's got his weight down, it could be exciting to see what he can do. Yeah, um, we actually haven't talked about Tom Dumoulin, yeah. defending champion. Also looked really short in form, to be honest. This year, he crashed at Torino, but somehow he's still the odds-on favourite. I mean, defending champion, fair enough. Um, but he's going into this race without us really knowing much about him. But Thinking back to last year, that's sort of what happened last year. No one was talking about him before the start, and they came through and won the thing. Or overall. Froome in the tour. You know, Froome in the exactly. tour hadn't won anything. But yeah. it's almost as if he's learnt how to train and he doesn't feel the need to win things leading into it. Yeah, although I think, I mean, I was looking at the results because um, we obviously think back to last year's tour where Froome didn't have any wins until he rode onto the Champs Elysees um, and won the tour overall. But before then, he had some decent results in the Dauphiné. Um, and to, warm-up races like that but this year he's really had absolutely nothing nothing yeah. has gone for him um, so he's going to be turning up at the Giro 
maybe he, he probably know in his own mind uh, what his form's like, but to the outside is going to be a bit of a mystery, to be honest. I think one thing we have to talk about is the current um, Salbutamol case hanging over Chris Froome, because no doubt that you would think has to cause massive stress and massive, you know, puts quite a lot of pressure on him. And you think that that cannot be ideal preparation for anyone coming into an event like this. You know, stress means you have increased cortisone and that it doesn't help recovery and doesn't help with trying to keep your weight down and things like that. So I think there's, you know, it could, it's going to be really tough for him. I think, well, yeah, but Froome has known that this has been the case for months now. He knows what's happening. He knows the process. I mean, we're on the outside looking in yeah. and we don't know what is going on. Through in his own mind, he knows what's happening. He knows how to prepare. And I, th I t to be honest, I think he'll be trying to prepare for this as if it, any other race. He's got a big team of lawyers and Team Sky staff behind him. They've got his back. They'll want him to, con to concentrate on this race. And whatever the outcome of that case, I think he'll uh, have prepared for this in as much the same way as he would any other race. So, in terms of other riders we want to talk about, mm -hmm. I was looking at Byrain Merida and I was like, wow, they've got a strong team. Yep. They've got Nibali, and then he's backed up by Visconti and Possevivo. What a climbing unit that is. Yeah, and then you see some of the first names. And... Yeah, then you realise it's not Vincenzo Nibali, it's Antonio Nibali. So, the Yuri yeah. Sagan of Bahrain Merida, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, onto Astana. Yeah. Um, I think someone that could surprise us with a good GC result here is potentially Miguel Angel Lopez. Yeah, I mean, he's looked in good shape this year. 10th uh, in Torino, 3rd third in the Abu Dhabi Tour. He's really showing good potential. And he's got a decent team behind him. I mean, Luis Leon Sanchez is a rider with loads of experience uh, riding for uh, Grand Tour contenders. Pelo Bilbao, Tanel Kanga and Alexi Lutsenko are also... Solid. They're strong riders. They'll be strong domestiques. Um, Lusenko is really another young rider um, with real promise. Uh, not sure whether this is the sort of race that will suit him. Maybe he's more suited to one week races rather than grand tours, but we'll see. Um, but Miguel Angel Lopez is a really strong climber. Mm. Just needs that consistency, really. Yeah. So we all love a good leadership contest. And I think the most obvious one initially that stands out from the start sheet is Mitchelton Scott. Yeah, I mean, Chavez and Yates all both have uh, good Grand Tour uh, rides behind them. Chavez were really wanting to bounce back from a nightmare 2017. But Yates have been in great form this year. Fourth in Catalonia, second in Paris-Nice. And uh, won the youth classification at Tour de France last year, of course. So he's really looking to, um, to push on, I think, and get that Grand Tour podium that he definitely has the potential to do. The atmosphere on the team bus is really positive. I yeah. actually don't think they're the sort of team that would have the leadership crisis. They they're just all... seem like a fun group of guys. Yeah, I know. It's like <laughs> Mitchelton Scott and EF Education First Dre Pack. They're yeah. sort of those two teams you think, if I'm going to be on the team, that's the one I want to yeah. be on. If I'm going to like the team barbecue, I want to go to like their yeah, party. It's exactly. going to be fun. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about EF Education First Dre Pack because they've got... Yeah. The longest um, team name in the world. Uh, yeah. We, we actually missed out a bit off the end. but. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Michael Woods is a really interesting, oh, interesting I'm guy. I'm a fan of Woodsy. A former runner, isn't he? Yeah. I mean, that's, yes, yeah, not, he's not a massively known rider. Some of you will be familiar with him, but he was a former competitive runner who's come to cycling quite late, but has shown excellent promise. I mean, seventh in the uh, Vuelta, mm -hmm. and he was also pretty handy in the Giro um, as well. So, He's, you know, he's, he's looking yeah, better. He's one of those guys you sort of like, if you'll fly under the radar and then you'll see the results in the third week and he's in seventh place. You're like, How's yeah. the, how the hell has he got there? Yeah. yeah, he's just a, he's a phenomenal climber, I yeah. think is the main thing. And he sort of does, you know, I think he really takes his running ability into his, into his climbing. When he sort like of just, a shroom. Yeah, he dances up there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he sort of just, he does dance quite gracefully up the climbs in, in this sort of running, almost like he's running. Yeah. Uh, but he is one to watch and I would certainly have him in my fantasy team I think as someone that's either going to do quite well in GC or perhaps win a summit finish. Yeah I think another rider to talk about is George Bennett in New Zealand of uh, Lotto and Oyumbo who was mm. really good first two weeks of the tour last year and then he got ill and just yeah. faded off the radar. Um, he's also got a strong team there I mean Robert Gessink is sort of one of those riders that's always 
it always seems to be there and you think yeah probably Robert guessing this year is his year um, but I think he'll probably be called into uh, domestic duties for Bennett and we'll see how he manages to get on but again he's another rider that's won won stages individual stages and yep. uh, seems to sort of like the mountainous days and we also haven't talked about Thibaut Pino who's returning to um, the Giro. Thibaut Pino. Yeah, I know, fourth last year, went off the podium on the final day. Um, last year, I don't know, he really seems to like the Giro. You would have thought a Frenchman who wants to be top form for the Tour de France, but the last couple of years, he's really targeted the Giro and then sort of just ridden the Tour to sort of see how he goes. But he was 10th in Catalonia, and he's looked in okay form, and you sort of think he's, he's a reliable GC rider at the Giro. I think he'll be up there as well. Every sprinter's favourite race. That's why they're all here, the Giro. So, sprinters, what's happening? Well, they're thin on the ground, I'm not going to lie. Um, Elia Viviani is probably going to be the biggest name rider. Somehow, he missed, it wasn't, it wasn't in teams, guys. Giro team last year, which was, I think he wasn't very happy with that. I think that's why he's no longer at Team Sky. Yeah, he wasn't too pleased with that. But Elia Viviani is probably the form sprinter so far this year. Every single race he's been in, every stage race he's been in, he's won stages. He's also won uh, Depana, he's won stages at Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Tour Down Under. And he's looked like he's got a new lease of life at Quick Step. He looks in really good shape. Um, anyone else that's in there that you think is a um, who's a sp I mean I'm really struggling to spot sprinters here yeah they, they, they are thin on the ground They're, um, it's going to be it's going to be one of those races where you have sort of some rider that you've half heard of finishing second in a sprint mm. you know like how has how has that happen or breakaways because without yeah. the big sprint trains there there's no one to chase the breakaways I mean we, we were joking about Barre Merida earlier um Giovanni Visconti is always there. Mm. Giovanni Visconti will win a stage at some point. He always wins a stage of Giro. It'll be from a breakaway. There'll be a 16-man breakaway that will go up the road, get 25 minutes or something, and Visconti will win it. Yeah, those you know, the sort of pseudo sprinters, the little, the punchy riders, people in the past that we've looked at, you know, it's like Michael Matthews, those sorts of mm. guys. Sasha Madolo is another one that springs to mind. It's like. A, that kind of rider, I think, could do well yeah. on those little uphill. And also, like, through the first couple of weeks, Giro does this really well. So it has, it really backloads the mountains and it builds through the race. So in that, those first few weeks, you've got those um, little punchy uphill finishes where the GC guys are just happy to get through it without, without crashing or without losing the odd five seconds here or there. And it's a real chance for the sort of lesser known punchy riders, maybe from like an Italian domestic team, to be able to get on the podium and really um, mix it with the big boys. I think we should both have a prediction, Henry, as to who we think is gonna win the Maglia Rosa and will be wearing it in Rome. I'm gonna go for Tom Dumoulin to go back to back Dumoulin. I, I wanna back Froome, but I'm just not sure about his form. And Dumoulin, we've shown in the past that um, even if he's not maybe on top form coming into a race, he's there, he can climb with the best and he's got the experience of what it's like to win the Giro. Froome, the Giro is a very different race than the Tour. Froome doesn't have so much experience of what it's like to be up here, he hasn't been here for years. Dumoulin has got the experience, he knows how to win this race and Sunweb, um, on paper they might not look like the most um, powerful team, but we saw last year that when they've got a man to get behind, they can really, really um, support a GC challenge and I'm backing him to do it two years in a row. Right, well, bearing in mind this video goes out before the Giro and there's every possibility that either rider we name is gonna encounter some kind of crash and unable to actually race the Giro, it's probably what's gonna happen. We but, are dooming them right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the journal Sorry, Tom. The journalist's curse is being firmly placed. I'm going to go for him. I think the route suits for him uh, better than some of the past tour routes. And so even though I agree, I don't think he's in top form. I don't think that his preparation has been as good as perhaps he would have liked. I just think that because the route suits him far better than previous tours that have been in re the last two Tour de France, I think this route is better for him than those. So thanks for watching. Those are our predictions. No doubt it, they're both 
I'm not even going to make it to the start line. But let us know your predictions as to who you think is going to win in the comments section below. And also, any predictions you've got about specific stages as well, because it'd be really interesting to read those. But I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, then why not like it and subscribe it, as this helps us to make more and better content in the future. But until then, see you next time.